greatest deliberative body. There aren't many Americans who would look at us right now and give us that, that uh, appropriate uh, moniker. We have to earn it. And I think in the next hours we can do that, Madam President. And I thank the chair and I thank my colleague for their forbearance. Madam President. Senator from Tennessee. Do um, you know how much time I have allotted? <clears throat> Uh, the Senate is in morning business with senators permitted for, to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Thank you, ma'am. I doubt I'll do this, but if I get up to eight minutes or so, if you'd let me know so I'd have two left. Uh, Madam President, uh, um, last time I was on the floor was July the 14th, and I was uh, uh, very concerned, maybe upset about the fact that it appeared that where we were on this debt ceiling discussion was, was looking for a, a political way for everybody to, to raise the debt ceiling without anybody taking ownership. And obviously that wasn't uh, what I came to the Senate to do, and I came down and had choice words uh, for both sides of the aisle in that regard. I, I actually come here today uh, with a glimmer of hope. And the reason that I say that, uh, to my knowledge, in this debt ceiling debate, uh, we may be I think this is the first time that actually legislation has been offered from both sides of the aisle to look at spending reductions uh, over the course of this next year. Now, um, to me, that is progress. And I, I think that we ought to focus on the fact that finally, here in this body, we're on the right subject, okay? We've sort of wandered around for, you know, in the wilderness here for several weeks as this debt ceiling was was coming up and, and focused on many things that were not going to solve the problem. And then a couple of weeks ago, we focused on a way to try to figure out a way for us to all usurp, get, get rid of our responsibilities in dealing with this. I'm kind of uplifted because, as was mentioned, uh, a Democratic senator has a proposal, a Republican House member has a proposal, and now finally, we're on the topic that matters, and that is we have proposals before us that are beginning to look at what we might do to look at spending reductions. I mean, the fact is the reason this debt ceiling debate is what it is is all of us are concerned about future deficits. All of us are concerned about where our country is going. All of us are concerned about the fact that if we don't deal with this issue responsibly, we're going to end up with a downgrade in our debt regardless. I mean, even if we make it, if we had a clean debt ceiling vote, which obviously is not going to occur now, if you had a clean debt ceiling vote, we'd be right back at the table trying to figure out a way to keep from having a downgrade. So for what it's worth, um, I'm choosing today to come to the floor and to be slightly optimistic because both sides of the aisle are beginning to look at ways of reducing that issue. Now, the rating agencies, and actually, uh, you know, we don't put a lot of faith in them, I know, but smart people that actually buy treasuries have said the order of magnitude that we need to, to deal with as it relates to deficit spending over the next short period of time is a minimum of $4 trillion. And that $4 trillion has to be real. And that $4 trillion needs to be accompanied by entitlement reforms. Now, Madam President, what I would say is that right now, I don't think there's any proposal that's being discussed that is strong enough. And I don't say that to, to knock any of the authors. There's nothing out there that I'm aware of that's being discussed by the media or being discussed on either, in either chamber that really deals with this issue. Most of us have taken a position that we want to use the debt ceiling vote to force dramatic reductions in deficits, dramatic reductions in spending, and fortunately, we've gotten to that place finally. We just, we just have gotten there in the last 24 hours. So this is my hope, Madam President. We know that none of the proposals that are out there now are strong enough. None of the proposals that are out there, I'm talking about in legislative language. Now, there are a lot of people working in, in other ways to try to come up with a solution, but there's no legislative language out there yet that actually forces us to do the things we need to do to achieve 
not being downgraded, if you will, after this debt ceiling vote occurs. And so what I would say is, I know we're, it, it appears we're going to be voting on, on a proposal that the majority leader has offered. Uh, it's very apparent to me that it's not going to pass. I know there's some activities that may be taking place in the House over the next 24 hours, but at least we have both sides of the aisle talking about the right topic, finally. It's taken us a while to get here. And I would urge that we sit down, figure out a way to make the proposals that are being discussed real, make sure they don't have gimmicks, and they force us to do those things that we need to do to make sure that we don't just kick the can down the road, pass something that looks like we've actually taken action, but to pass something instead that actually will address the issues that we have before us. So, so Madam President, again, I've got a glimmer of hope. Um, both sides of the aisle have offered proposals. No doubt, in both cases, not near strong enough, but both sides have offered proposals that look at reducing the deficits over the next year or so. So I would urge people to sit down like members have done recently on other proposals. Let's sit down and figure out a way to make some proposals strong enough that we know that not only have we moved past this debt ceiling vote, but we've also put in place those actions that will cause us to make it through this entire next year in a way that we know we're not going to be downgraded by the credit rating agencies and have other issues. There's not a proposal before us today that does it, but both sides of the aisle are talking about proposals. That, to me, is a sign for a degree of optimism if we need to extend the debt ceiling issue for a week while we work out the details or whatever, let's do it. But don't, let's don't let this opportunity where we finally have both sides of the aisle talking about the right subject, let's don't let this opportunity go by. Let's solve this problem while the focus is on it. And Madam President, I thank you for allowing me to come to the floor. I yield the floor. The Majority Leader. My business be extended until 5 o'clock. I'd be recognized at 5 o'clock, and that following the statement, Senator Corker, have you finished? That Senator um, Session be recognized for 10 minutes. Without objection. Madam President. Senator from Alabama. I thank the majority leader, and I appreciate his courtesy as always, and um, so many of the issues that come before the Senate. Um, I would just like to say a couple of things. One is fundamental, and that is that the crisis we face, and I think my senator colleague from Tennessee would agree, is not the debt limit, it's the debt. It's the surging debt. And the debt limit is Congress's power, and it says to the administration, you can't raise uh, you can't borrow any more money. We only authorize so much money to be borrowed. Uh, and like a 102-degree mark on your thermometer, it's not the thermometer that's the problem. It's the underlying fever that the thermometer indicates. So breaching the debt limit so soon after we raised it uh, is an indication that we have something unhealthy in our system that needs to be dealt with. Senator Reid has got very, very difficult challenges before him. Uh, it is not easy, but as I like to remind him, he asked for the job, and uh, hopefully he can uh, make progress uh, at this point in time. But to raise the debt ceiling... The majority leader knows a couple of things. He knows, one, that the Republican Congress and the American people want to see changes in our spending. It's on a reckless path. We cannot continue on this path. And so the idea is, shouldn't we change what we're doing that's uh, put us in a situation in which 
Forty cents of every dollar we spend today is borrowed. This year we will pay $240 billion in interest on our national debt. Under the budget that the President submitted to us that was voted down, I will acknowledge 97 to nothing in the Senate, but it indicates the debt path that we're on. Uh, it would cause, in the tenth year, interest to be paid in one year of $940 billion. A stunning figure. The federal road program is about 40. Federal age of education, education is about 100. We would be surging from 240 to 940 just in interest on this surging debt, according to the Congressional Budget Office, our experts. I would note also that despite the debts that we've been running up, President Bush's last year was an extraordinary deficit, $450 billion. President Obama's deficits have been $1,300 billion. $1,300 billion is expected this year to be $1.5 trillion, $1,500 billion. One year. These are the three years. And in the first two years of President Obama's administration, his non-defense discretionary spending surged 24%. And this does not count the stimulus, almost $900 billion that we surged out the door that was supposed to uh, stimulate the economy. So Speaker Boehner, and I think with support of the American people, uh, Speaker Boehner has uh, uh, said, well, we can do a long time, we can do a, a fairly large increase in our debt ceiling to allow the country to continue to borrow or we can do a short one, but we in the House and the Republican House believe we've got to confront our problems. So I would propose, and he has stated, that the House would vote to raise the debt ceiling, but only to the extent to which spending has been reduced an equal amount. So if you reduce spending enough, over 10 years, you get an immediate increase in the debt ceiling of an equal amount now. If you, if you uh, increase, if you reduce spending over 10 years, a larger amount, well, you could increase the debt limit a larger amount. And it's become a vehicle, an opportunity for the American people to understand how we're surging out of control, spiraling out of control, and how uh, it is that Congress has got to figure out a way to rein this in. It's just unsustainable, the path that we're on. Um, so this one dollar for one dollar increase in debt ceiling for one dollar uh, reduction in spending kind of caught on. People seem to be going along with that. Seem to be fairly reasonable. And Senator Reid uh, claims that the debt ceiling that he's got a plan that would reduce spending uh, 2.7 trillion dollars over 10 years and that this would allow him to raise the debt ceiling uh, about that, that amount, and that this would allow us to, uh, in effect, raise it enough that we wouldn't have to talk about this again for almost two years, about 22 months. <clears throat> well, okay. That sort of seemed to meet what Speaker Boehner had suggested, but I'm the ranking member of the Budget Committee, and I've been a real critic of what's been going on. I've been predicting we were going to end up at the last minute, a bill was going to be thrown on the floor, and I was concerned it was going to be filled with gimmicks, it wasn't going to be honest, and we were going to be told if we don't pass it, the Republic is going to uh, fall, and no matter what's in it, we've got to pass it. And don't worry about it. Uh, just take us, trust us on these numbers. Unfortunately, that's where we're getting. Senator Reed, in his $2.7 trillion in claimed deficit reduction, about $1.2 trillion of that is savings from the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, that's not ever been projected to stay at the current level of $158 billion. 
a year for 10 years. That's not, that's, that's an extra spending item. Speaker of a Boehner, when he proposes a proposal to reduce spending for a shorter term, he doesn't count savings from the declining war expenditure because that's not baseline expenditure. And we've never extended and planned to do that. We never plan to spend $158 billion a year the next 10 years. This is inevitably going to drop. Uh, the, some say it could go to zero. Some say to 50, uh, saving $100 billion, a, a little more a year for the next uh, uh, decade. So we calculate that uh, Senator Reid, the Budget Committee staff, um, Republican staff, calculates that this is a, over a $1 trillion dollars in inaccurate estimations of spending reductions. It just is. It should not be counted. Speaker Boehner doesn't count it in his numbers. He also claims Senator Reid does uh, $1.2 trillion in deficit reductions from spending caps by capping discretionary spending, that this would save $1.2 trillion. Well, those caps are counted from a baseline that ignores the savings that were enacted in the full year CR that we did, the year we're in. So what happened was we had a higher level of spending. There was an election last fall. A new Republican House was elected. Huge numbers of people who were elected who said, we got to do something about spending. And so we had a fuss over what our spending levels should be this year because we were operating not on the uh, authorization, uh, appropriation bills, but a continuing resolution. And that number was reduced. So the spending level for this year is not now, is not the same as it was when the year began. So the current level of spending is a number we ought to be talking about when we say we're going to save money, correct? It shouldn't be the number that was higher but has been abandoned and been reduced. So that reduces the amount of uh, legitimate claims and discretionary savings to approximately to less than $800 billion, or uh, instead of uh, there, uh, uh, or, or so. And then uh, he claims $100 billion in mandatory savings, but it's likely that those from our staff looking at them, uh, that it would amount to no more than $60 billion. So the bottom line is that uh, we've looked at this a lot of different ways. I believe the numbers that I'm going to repeat to you today will be sustained in any competitive argument about it. I believe these are honest and true numbers. The bottom line is that uh, the total real savings that's proposed by the Reed plan is not $2.7 trillion, but $1 trillion. And if you do $1 trillion in savings and you raise the debt limit by $1 trillion, then that would extend to six, eight months or so into early next year, which is, I suggest, where we ought to be because this amount of savings, one trillion, is nowhere near what we need to do to get off the debt course we're on. As Senator Corker indicated, uh, most of the financial experts are telling us we need at least four trillion dollars in savings, not one and so if we're, not, if we're just going to get one so we can vote in this crisis period to raise the debt limit before August 2nd so it, the checks and everybody can be paid and the government can operate, and I hope we can do that. We need to do that. But if all we're going to get is $1 trillion, this is just an interim step. This is not a real fix at all, but it's an interim step. And if so, we need to be right back on this issue soon. And that gives us an opportunity to do so uh, early next year or late this year. Because we have not solved the problem. One trillion dollars is not enough. Four trillion dollars is not enough. 
depending on how you calculate the debt that's been projected to accrue over the next 10 years, it's somewhere between 9 and $13 trillion. So $1 trillion is not going to do anything to change the disastrous debt course we're on. Now, by the way, the president just wants to say this because he was pretty tough last night blaming Republicans for all kinds of problems. Let me just say, the Republican House passed, and I voted for in the Senate, a budget for 10 years that changes the debt course of this republic. It puts us on a sound financial path. It reduced spending by as much as $6 trillion, $5 trillion over 10 years. It even reduced taxes to create more economic growth and make us more competitive in the world marketplace. It was a thoughtful, long-term, serious budget that would do, do real positive things for America. The Senate has not passed a budget, not had one marked up in the budget committee, the leadership here in the Senate refused to allow it to happen. Senator Reid said it would be foolish to pass a budget. We've gone now over two years without a budget. It's unthinkable in the debt course that we're on, how disastrous it is, how unsustainable it is, how unlike anything that's ever happened in our history, have this kind of debt path, and we don't have a budget. So the president said, you know, a few weeks ago, well, I've got a plan that cuts $3 trillion. Well, is it like Senator Reid's $2.7 trillion plan? It was never made public. It was never spelled out. If he had a $3 trillion plan to cut spending, well, let's see it. Maybe we could extend the, the uh, debt limit more. If he's going to cut $3 trillion in honest numbers, so if he has those numbers, as he said he has, in between attacking Republicans for causing all the problems, let's see it. Maybe that would be a basis for something. But I suspect, I suspect, it's no more accurate than this plan. Because when the president proposed his budget, as the law required him to do early in, in the year, he said... My budget calls on us as Americans to live within our means and to not increase the debt. When, according to the Congressional Budget Office, the lowest single budget deficit that would occur on the, his 10-year budget would be $750 billion. Nowhere close to a balanced budget. And in the outer years, that deficit would be going up. So I would just challenge the president. If he's got a $3 trillion plan, let's see it. Now, the pattern, some people say we need to have this longer period of time, and we can't afford to have a short period of time. This is somehow a, a wrong thing to do, and so forth. And I just would want to point out to them, my colleagues, that it's not unusual at all. A $2.7 trillion increase in the debt, if that were to occur, uh, would be very high. It would be a 19% increase in the current debt limit, putting the debt limit 50% higher than when President Obama took office. It would be the largest debt increase in history, the fourth debt limit increase during President Obama's tenure in office, the fourth time it's been raised. So this is not unusual. So I've warned from the beginning that if we skirted the legislative process in favor of closed door, White House meetings and so forth, we would find ourselves in the 11th hour with gimmick-filled legislation being rushed through a panic-driven Senate. This is not re responsible governance from our leadership here in the Senate. 
As I feared and as I've just described, the majority leader's bill does not achieve close to the promised savings that he says it would. Far from the $2.7 trillion in cuts claimed, the true spending cuts in the proposal are closer to $1 trillion over 10 years, less than half of what was advertised, while he's asking for a nearly $3 trillion increase in the debt limit. Spending cuts next year would be only $3 billion less than the enacted amount for 2011. This falls short of the idea that a dollar in cuts should accompany a dollar in debt limit increase. Senator Reed's proposal is structured in a way that is clearly designed to further degrade and undermine the budgetary process of the United States Senate. And it allows uh, the majority not to have to come forward and produce a budget plan. So, Given the late hour, rather than rush through a poorly vetted piece of legislation to provide the President the largest debt ceiling increase in history, we should pursue a more responsible approach. A short-term extension with real cuts through the immediate time period the extension covers, not 10 years down the road, then using the extra time that, that we have Congress should pursue a binding framework like the cut, cap, and balance plan to bring these gimmicks to an end and to alter our debt course. We should try the one thing we've refused to do from the beginning, open hearings, regular order, and real legislative process and public participation. Madam President, I thank the chair and would yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll.
Thank you. 
Thank you.
Thank you.